Thanks very much, uh, Chair, and thanks to the committee for uh, allowing me to come in on the discussion. Look, I, I have a couple of, uh, and thanks to their, our, all our contributors. Uh, I have some questions that are maybe a bit more detailed, but a couple of just initial general questions, stroke observations. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the victims of this mess, and it is a mess, uh, are the TV license playing public, who can go to jail if they don't pay their TV license, and the vast majority of the RT staff uh, who don't enjoy staggering salaries uh, and often and it had to endure pay cuts, pay freezes, and uh, lack of resources, and so on. On that second group, uh, given that there is, there has been an acknowledgement from yourselves that this is a mess, that there's been some big, big mistakes made here, uh, and that something has to be done to reform uh, public RTE, in order to protect public service broadcasting. Have you engaged with the elected representatives of the staff since all of this blew, blew up to get their opinions and thoughts on what has happened? Uh, because my understanding is that hasn't really happened on any sort of formal level. Now, they're out protesting. They're very worried, and they're very angry. And I think, as a matter of absolute urgency, uh, the executive and the board need to listen to the workers and the staff in there who are victims of this, uh, as to what you know is happening to them, uh, and to listen to their ideas about what needs to change in RTE. Yeah, just after that one, we will obviously since last Thursday. Things have been very dynamic on all set of levels. So we have been very focused on trying to bring information to the House to prepare for this. But we will immediately engage with those representative groups in, in terms of having an engagement and input from the staff, 100%. Yeah. OK. Secondly, um, look, I am firmly of the view, and you're alluding to it, uh, is that the, that commercial and advertising, um, you, you would say there's a tension between them and the public service mandate. I'll, I'll go further than maybe you're willing to, if you want to comment, please do, that it is a malign influence uh, that threatens, very seriously threatens, to undermine the integrity of public service broadcasting and that this mess is evidence of that. Uh, so, I certainly think we have to look at the funding model because I think if you don't have a proper funding model, you get forced into this, and quite honestly, the government have to be held to account, in my view, uh, for forcing the institution into reliance on commercial and advertising, and that then inevitably brings you into murky waters uh, where you've got to wine and dine corporate executives to get advertising and revenue, and that opens up all sorts of possibilities for the sort of stuff that is frankly infuriating people here, uh, of accounts paying for trips, flip-flops, parties, uh, whatever it is. Um, so if you would like to comment on that, but the, the one thing I want to say is, I fully acknowledge that and think we need to address it, we need to face up to it. But it doesn't really fully explain, or does it, why we're here, uh, the specifics of why we're here. Um, because, you know, I put it, I think, to you, Adrian, or to Shun last week, that this looked like organised deceit, and you acknowledged that it was organised deceit. Now, if, if it was organised deceit, Somebody organised it. And it is still not clear who exactly organised it. Uh, and do you agree we need to know that? And that the people, the staff, the public, 
the Oireachtas need to know who organised this deceit. And do you still stand over, indeed, the fact that this is organised deceit that we're dealing with that was at the heart of this? So, <coughs> in terms of the three payments, so I think it's good to distill it right down to what is the issue. The issue is the three payments yeah. that have been made to Ryan Tuberty directly from RTE that should have been declared when these numbers were laid before the House of the Oireachtas and to the public. That's the first thing to say. I think when you step back, and the Chair has already alluded to it, in terms of the relationship between commercial and public service, the way RTE is structured, our revenue is 200 million from licence fee and 149 million from commercial, not insubstantial. The Future of Media Commission, uh, which, which you know, forensically, forensically looked at models for public service, looked across Europe, you can see that the vast majority of public service broadcasters in Europe are 100% funded through some mechanic, and they don't have this level of advertising. A company like the BBC, for example, that is license fee, plus they have BBC Studios, which is at arm's length from the company that generates from their international sales about 1.2 billion. So it does, to the chair's earlier comment, raise questions about how public service media should be funded. And I think through all the debate here and all the noise around these three payments that have been made, you know, the only piece of light is the recognition by the House of the importance of public service media and that it should be correctly funded in a way that it can achieve its objectives with no, as you said, malign influence. And I'm not saying that commercial is malign influence, but that there is a clarity and a transparency to it. But would you also say that the quid pro quo for the funding that can restore the integrity of public service broadcasting, deal with that tension by eliminating it, in my view, that's what needs to happen, but the quid pro quo for that is to address the other thing that is infuriating people about all of this, is the staggeringly high levels of salaries of a fairly significant, but ultimately small minority, but a significant number of people at the top, both presenters, executives, board members, managers, who are on staggering salaries. And that that just does not sit well with people. Uh, and I would ask Moya to, you know, I, I'll put it directly to Moya in this. I mean, you said about presenters having charisma and so on. Now, I mean, I just, how should I put this? Of course, they're an important part of the process. But you see, certainly I seriously question, and I, I put this to the, the executive, this sharp distinction between a group who are the talent and everybody else who makes the programmes. Um, so don't we need to deal with that? Because it feeds into this notion that some people have to get extortionate salaries and then there's everybody else, who to my mind is every bit as important in putting those shows together, often coming up with the ideas to put those shows together. The researchers, the sound people, the camera people, you know, all sorts of people. It's not just Deputy, the person at the front. I agree entirely with you. I went into that organisation as a typist. I was a broadcasting assistant, a production assistant, a small time presenter, and I ended being a producer director. I was never on a high salary. I worked with people who were on very high salaries. I never wanted to be a manager. I wanted to stay within producing. The tension you so rightly mention, what has happened is the entire ecosystem has changed, and we must not forget that. This is not the way things were 20 years ago. When the huge salaries were agreed and there was competition out there, it is very difficult to get those salaries back. As the organization said earlier on, they were reduced by 30% and they were reduced by a further 15%. That's a 45% saving in all but one salary, where we know we didn't get the saving because there was a clandestine arrangement. So now it is absolutely time, and if any good is to come of this, that all you leaders and representatives around this 
um, table will actually lead the way in the proper debate and make a public service media that is fit for purpose in the 21st century. And that we never have these conversations ever again, that people fe feel properly remunerated, fairly treated, and their voices heard. Okay, I don't know if there's any further comment on that, but, I, but I, I do think that means salary caps, to be honest, that bring the salaries way down further at that top level. I've got to be honest with you, because I think it infuriates people looking at it. Just a few, maybe last, specific, yeah, just a, a couple of things, right? It was mentioned about a register of interests, and I think it was referred to about people on air. Could I suggest that it should, there should be a registered interest for everybody? Uh, and that includes board members and executive members. Uh, because even if you're not on air, you can have significant influence over the expenditure of public money. Uh, and therefore, the question of conflicts of interest are hugely important. Uh, and those things need to be registered, uh, and people need to acknowledge if there are potential conflicts of interest so they can be seen in a fully transparent way. Secondly, I would just, I personally, I mean, Shun may have been aware of, of this, the, the uh, uh, questions I've been raising about issues in the film industry, where some of the employment conditions that we've heard from RTE workers, poor employment conditions of buyout contracts for actors and writers and performers, the use of successive fixed term contracts, uh, bogus self-employment and so on, that there are allegations within the wider film and audiovisual sector that the same things are happening there, right? Uh, Equity are waging a campaign at the moment. Film crew uh, have raised this. And RT is involved in that, in that 40 million euro every year goes into, and I want to see that money go into drama and independent production. But if we look honestly in the aftermath of this, are there questions now to be raised about similar disparities from people at the very top getting high producer fees uh, and then people on fairly poor conditions of remuneration are not getting the royalties and so on. Are these things that need to be seriously looked at and acknowledged at this point? As a former producer, I just make one point. Um, and obviously we engage with Screen Producers Ireland. Producers are company owners who work in the television sector don't tend to be the ones who make, with some exceptions, significant profits, actually. Running production companies is very difficult. It is economically challenging, and people sacrifice a huge amount to make documentary films, to make dramas, to make uh, low-budget independent films. So the idea that there is an elite within the industry and then normal uh, workers just isn't true in my experience. It, I, I'm sure that's true for the vast majority. I'm sorry, Brendan, I won't be yeah. long. I'm sure that's true for the vast majority. But it is the case, from certainly my knowledge of it, that there are a relatively small number of, of producers that get the bulk of public financial support through various mechanisms. And, OK, and if it's not true, fine, right? But equity say that they are being forced to sign buyout contracts both within RT and in productions funded with public money and that there's uh, abuse of fixed term workers legislation in the uh, film industry and we've obviously heard about the bogus self-employment right and that in some cases some cases extortionate producer fees at the top are you saying that's not happening at all so I, I'm not that familiar with the deals that are in the film industry. I know in the main, most company owners are actually living hand to mouth. I would say also, obviously, the industry has changed significantly. So if you look at the producers who are working for streaming uh, companies now, they will only get the contract with them if they have a buyout. So it's like a cost plus model rather than a royalty model. So that's what the writer's strike is about at the moment in the States. Yeah.